thousands of delegates from around the world are in the German city of Bonn. They're racing to resolve outstanding issues in implementing the Paris Climate Accord. Nearly 200 countries signed the agreement back in 2015, committing to limit the century's global average temperature increase to no more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. We'll have more on the issues in just a moment. But first, here's a look at how countries compare in terms of CO2 emissions. With 28% of global emissions, China is the biggest offender. The United States at 16% comes in at number two. Germany with just over 2% comes in sixth place. But it's a very different story when you look at per capita emissions. Here, Qatar comes out way on top. The average person there emits over 30 tons of CO2 each year. That's twice as much as the average person in the US. And many times the global average of less than five tons per head. Now carbon trading, the buying and selling credits to emit CO2 is a big topic at those climate talks I mentioned. Earlier today, I spoke to Stefan Ramsdorf, a climatologist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate and Research. I asked him why he thinks that carbon trading would be an effective measure to curb emissions. It's basically essential part of getting out of the CO2 emissions because, as I said, we're fighting against the market prices if emitting is simply free. Indeed. Now, you've talked about uh, the role of new technologies. Could you tell us a little bit more about what industry's role should be in terms of achieving the climate goals? Well, first of all, some of the fossil industries need to stop lobbying against climate protection and climate legislation. It's been recently revealed that the five biggest oil companies alone spend $200 million per year lobbying and delaying climate against climate uh, legislation. And I think industry needs to change their business model to be compatible with the Paris Agreement rather than trying to cling to the old one and trying to undermine the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And what advice would you have for governments in terms of trying to combat this kind of lobbying that you mentioned from corporations to try and undermine the reaching of these goals? Well, the governments shouldn't uh, basically listen too much to special interest lobbying, but have the interest of humanity and their own citizens on their mind first and foremost. But is there any way to ensure that that happens? Is there any mechanism to ensure that uh, governments put humanity's interests first and not corporate interests? Well, I think basically the people have to put pressure on the government as is happen, happening now, for example, with the Worldwide Fridays for Future movement where the students are demonstrating in the streets. And we have seen already in Germany that that has really woken up the, the politicians who really haven't, they've lost the last 10 years in terms of emissions reductions. And now our chancellor, she's last week she visited our institute, for example, uh, she's uh, putting climate protection back near the top of the agenda. And that's where it belongs. So that sounds like a rather hopeful development. Uh, you're often quoted as saying that the future of civilization is at stake whenever you've been quoted in the media. Do you feel heard? Well, um, not enough, obviously, because uh, we have very little time uh, to lose now. We are currently, we can still emit worldwide around about 800 billion tons of carbon dioxide, and that is about 20 years worth of CO2 emissions. And then we've emitted uh, so much that we can't stay well below two degrees as is stipulated in the Paris Agreement anymore. So it's a race against the clock now because politicians haven't listened for the last decades uh, to the science. After all, first official report warning for, from global warming dates from 1965. A message of urgency from Mr. Stefan Ramsdorf. He's a climatologist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate and Research. Thank you very much. Thank you.